Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We start the remaining part of the paper that we were doing, the March 2016 paper 1-2. And we will continue with the questions that were left from the previous video. So this is the uh, video 2 on continuation of the previous video which I have just done. We we'll start with question 27 which was left out of the previous video. Which evidence supports the cohesion tension theory for the movement of water in flowering plants? Now, when the rate of transpiration of a tree is at its maximum, the diameter of the trunk is at its minimum. When a plant shoot is removed close to the base of the stem, sap leaks out from the cut. Evaporation of water from a porous pot can exert a force that draws water up a glass tube attached underneath the pot. Droplets of water form at the edge of leaves of plants growing in conditions of soil with high water content and air with high humidity. So which evidence supports the cohesion tension theory? Now that's only one and three. Because cohesion tension means that the water molecules sort of form hydrogen bonds with each other and that creates a sort of a force which is called the cohesion tension theory. Then coming to question 28, cardiac muscle is made of many fibers that form the walls of the chambers of the heart. When the heart contracts, these fibers shorten in length so that the muscle creates a force that exerts a pressure on the blood causing it to move. Which statement explains the difference in thickness of the walls of the ventricles of the heart? The ventricle, you know, the right and the left ventricle is difference in thickness because the left ventricle is thicker. So there is more muscle in the wall of the right ventricle than of the left ventricle because more pressure is needed to push blood into the aorta than into the pulmonary artery. That's all BS. The number of muscle fibers in the left ventricle is greater than the number in the right. So their contraction is more force exerting more pressure. That was the correct answer. But why are the others wrong? C was wrong because the space available to fill with blood inside the left ventricle is smaller than that of the right ventricle, so more pressure is needed to force blood out. But they told you in the question is when the heart contracts, the fibers shorten. So they had given you some information in the question. And then D, why was D wrong is that the wall of the right ventricle is thicker than that of the left ventricle. That is, of course, wrong. That's factually wrong because the wall of the right, left ventricle is thicker. Then coming to question 29, which reactions take place at a higher rate in a capillary in an alveolus than in the capillary in an active muscle? So carbon dioxide plus water, carbonic acid, carbon dioxide plus hemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin. Oh, that's the one which is the one which is going to check whether you remember this or not. Then hemoglobin plus hydrogen ions, hemoglobinic acid, then hydrogen carbonate ions plus hydrogen ions uh, turns into carbon dioxide plus water. So which reactions take place at a higher rate in a capillary in the a, in an alveolus than in capillary in the active muscle? So in an alveolus, you know, of course, what is happening, the carbon dioxide is going to go back into the alveoli, into the air, so that we can exhale it out. So it was four only. Why? Because the hydrogen carbonate ions and the hydrogen ions combine and then forms carbonic acid and dissociates into carbon dioxide and water. And the carbon dioxide, of course, moves out into the alveolus. And of course, this is a diagram which I have given you, which of course helps you to understand this part of the syllabus, which you need to revise if you don't remember this. And question 30. The diagram shows the effect of three different concentrations of carbon dioxide on the oxygen dissociation curve for human hemoglobin. And as I always tell you, you write little figures here. And then you write figures here. And it says uh, percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen and X is partial pressure 3 kPa. And Y is 5 kPa. And Z is 7 kPa. And what effect does increasing carbon dioxide concentration have on hemoglobin? It makes it less efficient at taking up oxygen, less efficient at releasing it. It makes less efficient taking up oxygen, more efficient at releasing it. It makes more efficient. So what effect does increasing carbon dioxide concentration have on the hemoglobin? And you can see from the graph 
what is happening as the partial pressure uh, increasing carbon dioxide concentration have on the hemoglobin. So if you draw, I always say is just draw a line on the graph and read this off, then read this off, then read this off. So it gives you a very good idea about X, Y, and Z. And then of course you understand that and then you read them again and then you of course figure it out which one was the correct answer. Then coming to 31, it says the graph shows the changes that take place in the volume of the left ventricle during one cardiac cycle. Which point on the graph represents the start of atrial systole? Now, of course, you can say the ventricular volume. This is, of course, on the y-axis and this is the time. So when the volume is zero and then what happens as it starts to increase again and then, of course, it increases further. So the answer to this was C and you needed to revise the cardiac cycle graph which is of course one of the favorite graphs which uh, we keep on telling you to revise and understand very thoroughly and I'm sure you can get this uh, from the internet and look at it and revise it uh, and see that you know it very well. Coming to question 32, the following tissues carry an electrical impulse during the cardiac cycle, atrioventricular node, muscle wall of atria, perkine tissue, sinoatrial node, in what order does the electrical impulse travel during the cardiac cycle? Now everybody knows that it's the sinoatrial node is a pacemaker of the heart. So four had to be first. So it could be either C or D. You always narrow your MCQ choice to two, which are the possible answers. So it was 4213 or 4231. And of course, uh, as everybody knows, it is 4213. 42 is 4 is sinoatrial node, muscle ball of the atria. 1 is AV node, and then the perkine tissue must come right to the end. So everybody needs to revise it. You need to look at this diagram. You need to revise it. You must know all these different parts how the electrical impulses are generated from the sinoatrial node. It's myogenic, initiates its own impulse, and how it is then carried to the uh, different parts of it. So number one, first sinoatrial node, then muscle ball of the atria, and then the AV node. So the answer was four, two, one. So four, two, one, and then of course three. Then coming to question 33, some of the effects of smoking are listed. Uh, it causes coughing, increases blood pressure, it decreases the transport of uh, oxygen. It increases the risk of cancer. It prevents cilia from moving. So which components of tobacco smoke cause these effects? Now, you know tar, carbon monoxide. Only carbon monoxide decreases the transport of oxygen because it forms carboxyhemoglobin inside the red blood cell. And you can see how it has all these effects. Nicotine is addictive. Carbon monoxide reduces the oxygen carrying capacity. Tar causes lung cancer and many other forms of cancer and particulates, of course, damage the lung surfaces. So the answer to this was simply, I mean, if you look at it and you concentrate on it, and then you can figure this out, is that uh, what was really the answer? So tar was 1, 4, and 5, causes coughing, cancer, prevents the cilia from moving. Carbon monoxide was only three, and there was only one answer, and there was only one answer which was possible, and that was B. And that was the one which you were supposed to figure out. So I'm sure uh, you all could figure this out. It was not such a challenging question. Going to question 34, the photomicrograph shows a section through part of a bronchus wall. And what is the function of the tissue labeled X? Now, if you look at this part, which is the X part, now, if you look at many other micrographs of the uh, different lung bronchus walls, and so you can see this was the cartilage. So the cartilage is what is the function of the tissue labeled X and contracts to constrict the airways, helps to widen the airways when at high altitudes, produces mucus, supports the airway to prevent collapse. So uh, you need to go through these different micrographs and please just type in micrographs of bronchus and all that. And of course, you will be able to figure this out. Then question 35, which of the following increase the risk of contracting TB? Uh, drinking unpasteurized milk, eating shellfish which have fed on raw sewage and that results in cholera. 
living in overcrowded conditions and you know of course TB is an airborne droplet infection so you know sometimes there is uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium bovis and bovis is the result of uh, uh, cattle which have tuberculosis and if you drink the unpasteurized milk and overcrowded condition means that you know you are more exposed to droplet infection and that of course could result in uh, tuberculosis and the spread of tuberculosis. Uh, then let's look at question 36. One control method to reduce the spread of malaria is to use an insecticide. It can be used to treat mosquito nets. Another control method is to completely cover areas of water with insoluble polystyrene balls that float on the surface. Using this information, what are the reasons for these control methods? So, of course, nets treated with insecticide will kill some mosquitoes. Uh, polystyrene balls will restrict the breathing of the mosquito larva. So you know the mosquito larva come to the surface of the water to breathe. So the answer to this was C. The rest of all of course is all uh, not correct. Then coming to question 37. Now in question 37, if you look at question 37, what is not an example of antibiotic action? Damage to cell surface membranes, prevention of protein synthesis, prevention of synthesis of new cell walls, and stimulation of antibody production. So antibiotics kill bacteria and lymphocytes produce antibodies. So antibiotic is something else and antibodies are something else. So we had to, not an example of antibiotic action. So antibiotics will of course damage cell membranes of bacteria, will prevent protein synthesis in bacteria, will prevent synthesis of new cell walls in bacteria but it does not stimulate antibody production. Lymphocytes are, are produce antibodies in response to a number of reactions which are occurring because of the antigenic exposure. So question 38, which correctly identifies the role of B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes? Now the humoral immune response and the uh, Cell mediated immune response, this of course now no longer in the syllabus, so of course we will not be discussing this anymore. So, but of course the answer to this was A, secrete antibodies B lymphocytes, secrete cytokines T lymphocytes. The humoral response is the one which is of course the B lymphocytes. But this of course has been removed from the syllabus now. Then coming to question 39. A person blood group is determined by antigens present on the red blood cells. The table shows the antigens and antibodies in the blood of people with blood groups. During a blood transfusion, it is essential that the recipient's blood does not contain antibodies to the donor's blood. So there's a donor's blood and the recipient blood receiving, receiving, the one who is getting the blood transfusion. Which blood groups can be given to a person with blood group B? So we have to realize is that we have to give, who can we give blood group B? So B and O, O is also called the universal donor. Why? Because they have no antigens on their red blood cells. Then uh, question 40. Now if you look at question 40, it's a very good question. An enzyme hydrolyzes the two heavy polypeptide chains of an antibody molecule. The hydrolysis occurs at the hinge region. So the hydrolysis occurs at the hinge region and breaks the antibody into three fragments. One, two, three. So three fragments. It says how many of these fragments? How many of these fragments are able to bind to antigens? Actually this part cannot bind. It's only this part and this part which can bind to an antigen. So this was the two. So let's look at the question again. An enzyme hydrolyzes the two heavy polypeptide chains of an antibody molecule. The hydrolysis occurs at the hinge region and breaks the antibody into three fragments. You see it breaks this part and this part. So this part becomes separate and this part becomes separate. And this of course becomes separate. So three fragments, that's what it said in the question. How many of these are able to bind to the antigen? Yes, this is an antigen binding site. This is an antigen binding site. 
please understand the um, structure of an antibody. We have the heavy chain and then we have the light chain. So this is the heavy chain. And then we have the light chain and then we have the carbohydrates. Why? Because this is antibodies are globular proteins. And they're glycoproteins. Why? Because they have a guy of carbohydrate part and they have the disulfide bonds. And you can see where the disulfide bonds are present, which is joining the heavy chain with the light chain. Heavy with the heavy and then of course joining the heavy and the light. So please revise this, the antibody molecule. Just pause this video here and have a look at it. And uh, that finishes this uh, paper. And I hope this has been helpful. And uh, please uh, do the entire paper first on your own. And then, of course, go through this video and see uh, what are the areas which you were not clear about. And uh, thank you very much once again.